Well, thank you so much uh, for having me, um, to Wayne McCarthy for organizing us and uh, getting this going. We're always happy to talk about Norm Vega Park. And so what I'll be doing is uh, sharing some slides and telling you more about the history of the park. And uh, then um, Sarah Levitt Goldberg, who is my co-author of the book, will be joining me uh, for the Q&A session. So let me share my screen and um, show you the slides. OK, um, so everyone can see this now, I, I assume. And yes, uh, yes. so what I want to focus on is just telling you a little bit about the history of the park and the kind of entertainment that was presented because it changed over the years from when the park opened in 1896 until it closed in the early 1960s. Um, before I, I really get started, I'd like to acknowledge that Newton is the traditional homeland of the Massachusetts people and Norm Bega Park was built on this land. Uh, the book that we wrote uh, is uh, Norm Bega Park and the Totem Pole Ballroom. It's from Arcadia Publishing and you can definitely find it uh, at Historic Newton's website and at the two museums that we run, the Jackson Homestead and the Durant Kenrick House and Grounds. Um, so the park opened in 1897 as a destination at the end of the Commonwealth Avenue Street Railway Company. Look how the streetcars looked back then. It's amazing they held up. They look a little tenuous, especially the mechanism underneath. Uh, but the street railway was new and people who built it wanted a destination at the end so people would ride it on the weekends and it wouldn't just be a commuter line. In the first uh, year of the park, it succeeded beyond anyone's wildest imagination. Uh, in the first five years of operation, approximately 40,000 people would visit on a typical summer weekend. And the park at that time was only open from May to September, though eventually the zoo and the boating seasons extended a little bit beyond that. So what was the um, popular um, attitude or the attitude about popular entertainment back at that time? Um, I wanted to just give a snapshot of what people were up to uh, right around 1900 and uh, how the park fit into that. So the population of Newton in that year, 1900, was 33,587. By contrast, now that's almost 89,000 people. And um, interestingly, at that time, the demographics were a bit different. There were 2,900 residents of Irish origin and 1,275 from Canada's maritime provinces. Uh, but interestingly, the Italian immigrants really didn't come until later on. That was more in the 1910s, 1920s. There were only five Italians listed in the Newton directory. In, um, so um, there were some other immigrants. Uh, the, there was a Chinese laundry listed uh, that was operating in 1900. And what did people do for fun if they didn't go to the amusement park? Well, the ad on the left tells you a little bit about bicycles, golf, athletic goods, bicycles, automobiles, and uh, gymnastics, and dancing calisthenics. So that's uh, what people did for fun. Uh, or those were some of the things. Another thing they did for fun was uh, on the left, you'll see a stereoscope. You might have seen one of these in operation. Uh, you basically put a uh, card with a photo on it. The image on the right shows what you could see through the stereoscope and it, it made the image look 3D. And that was very popular in the days before television where people felt like they could have photographs from exotic destinations or also from the Boston Public Garden and more local attractions right at their fingertips in their parlors. So that's another thing that people were doing. Um, so the park offered 
more uh, hands-on types of things. And its Riverside location really contributed to what it offered. Boating was already popular on the Charles River in the so-called Lakes District, which was the area between Newton Lower Falls and the Moody Street Dam. And uh, I believe the uh, factory or the former factory where the Charles River Museum of the Industry is located uh, created the dam that um, created the Lakes District. So it was a, a fairly flat area of water on the Charles River, which uh, certainly made it easier for people to go out in the canoes and not have rough water, rocks, that sort of thing. Um, around 1900, approximately 5,000 canoes and other pleasure boats were stored in boat houses in the Lakes District. So that would include Waltham. Um, and at Norumbega Park, patrons could arrive by boat. They could also rent boats when they got there. Um, and they could also arrive by bicycle. There was a big bicycle craze right around the turn of the 20th century. And uh, this bike shed is where people stored their bikes when they went to the park. So uh, that was another thing people could do. Um, and another attraction was that people could escape their crowded locations in the city and have this nice natural environment where there was the river and there was a park-like setting. The population of Newton grew by 9,000 people between 1890 and 1900. And Boston was also very crowded. It added 110,000 residents between 1900 and 1910. So a weekend at the park was considered restorative and rejuvenating. And this was also before public parks were widespread. So it was definitely appealing in that way. Um, once inside the park, people wanted to make it worth their while. <laughs> the mastermind of a lot of this was Adams Claflin. Oh, His God. father was the governor of Massachusetts and they had a summer home in Newton uh, back when Newton seemed like a very far destination from Boston. And uh, they ended up donating part of their land for the high school, which is now where Norton, Newton North High School is located. Um, so this is Adams Claflin, and he was the president of the street railway company that uh, built the park. And his manager, who we don't have a picture of, Carl Alberti, set the tone for the park, which was very uh, family friendly. They advertised, and I'm quoting here, good order maintained with an internal police force to eject, quoting, objectionable characters. They also had a strict policy against alcohol inside the park and that stayed in place the entire history of the park. So early on, right, uh, from the park's opening until about 1910, uh, this area, the open air theater was the heart of the park. And you can see it was pretty rustic. It was called the rustic theater and people sat on wooden benches and the stage was covered by a uh, canvas flap. So it wasn't very weatherproof, uh, nor was it very fancy. Um, but over time it kept expanding and then uh, the stage and the theater became enclosed to protect people from the elements. Vaudeville shows were the order of the day. These are um, a couple of different um, acts. One is uh, dancing girls doing um, some acrobatics. And uh, the other is more of a variety show. You can't see in the photo uh, too clearly, but along with the guitar and the gun and some flowers, they also have some sausages that are linked together. So they did lots of different skits with those props. Um, and uh, vaudeville shows were presented twice a day at the park in its early days. Um, there are a lot of famous American entertainers who started off in vaudeville, including W.C. Fields, Will Rogers, Sammy Davis Jr., Gracie Allen, and Judy Garland. So it was really the dominant form of entertainment early in the 20th century. 
And to supplement the vaudeville, which required ticket, they also at Normbiga had a bandstand. And uh, this on the left on the bottom is uh, a house band that performed there. And at the top uh, is a picture of an audience at the bandstand. They also sometimes had puppet shows there, uh, but the band would perform several times a day too. So if somebody went to the park, they could walk around and uh, hear music without having to pay extra for it. Um, also at the beginning of Norbega Park, there was a zoo and um, zoos, we now are, are really used to them, but they really were not that popular until the early 20th century. It was a way for people to see exotic animals from all around the world. Um, they um, helped people from urban areas experience more of what they thought the natural world was. Uh, the Franklin Park Zoo opened in 1912, so it was right within that time frame of when zoos became popular. And the park kept a range of animals. You see the lion there, but they also had a leopard, peacocks, a kangaroo, and monkeys. And the monkeys were really naughty. They were very good at escaping their enclosures and they would go off down uh, Islington Road, which was close to the Waltham border and knock over trash cans and cause mayhem. So um, they were not very popular with the neighbors. Uh, the bear is uh, something that uh, there was a bear uh, exhibit pretty much throughout the history of the park. Um, eventually it became expensive for the park to maintain all these different animals, especially during the winter, they had to go to a warmer location and, and be fed all winter and only have people looking at them for a very small portion of the year. And so they kept the bear exhibit as a way to advertise that they had animals at the park, even though the zoo itself had closed. Um, that was uh, in 1942 that the zoo closed. But the zoo animals were not the only animals to appear at the park. Uh, here is a very famous elephant named Tilly. And uh, when uh, she was part of the Robinson Traveling Circus, and this circus traveled to the park every summer for about 30 years. And when Tilly died in 1932, uh, 2000 people attended her funeral, which is pretty amazing. So certainly there were animals uh, and vaudeville shows, uh, but what else could you do at the park? Um, there was a midway and on it was a carousel with uh, some painted wooden animals. And interestingly, after the park closed in the 60s, some people got together and decided they wanted to save the animals. And so um, they were going to be given away, but, but a preservation group um, got together and, and saved some of them. Um, and uh, this carousel was part of the park for the entire 66 years that the park was in business. Um, there was also a penny arcade and uh, ski ball. Not sure how many people here have played ski ball, but um, I used to play at a, an old amusement park in New York State. And it's very fun. It's kind of like bowling, except you're rolling the balls up um, a, it's almost like a hill into a target rather than trying to knock down pins. Um, and you can see the prices were fairly cheap, nine balls for five cents. Um, also on the midway was a fortune teller. You see her at the bottom right. And uh, her husband actually lived at the park all summer and told people's fortune. And uh, the art of fortune telling at that time was called divination. And it, it certainly ran counter to most religious teachings. Uh, but people considered it a form of entertainment in the early 20th century. So there were also lots of rides and uh, the early ones at the park were often to do with um, daredevil acts. Um, here um, you can see a um, couple performing in the area behind the theater. Uh, they needed 
to expand some space because uh, some of these acts just didn't fit in the theater. And so it was called the hollow. And uh, on the right is somebody going off a high dive and, uh, or he's about to go off a high dive, um, climbing up the ladder and then jumping off and landing in a small tank of water, quite a feat. There was a group of uh, acrobats called the um, Airplane Girls. And this was playing up the aviation craze in the 1920s. And um, it's right after World War I when so many uh, airplanes were used in the war, people got interested in aviation for recreation after that. So the trapeze that they were using looked kind of like an airplane. It's not that hard, uh, easy to see on the right, but there they are spinning around on their airplane like um, contraption. And uh, this is a image of uh, a children's theater troupe. At the middle is the son of the park's official photographer who seemed to be in a lot of photos. I think his uh, dad was a bit uh, starstruck or, or wanted his son to be um, a star in a lot of the photos. Um, but uh, these children needed a special permit from the city of Newton to appear in the show. And uh, by 1929, there were more than a hundred different children's performers in this per one particular show. So it was quite popular. The uh, rides also included, the automobile was around in the early days of the park, but it, it really was getting more and more popular as the 20th century went along. And so some of these rides um, were to give people a chance of, of trying their hand at driving in a, a controlled way. The bumper cars are on the left and uh, the Custer cars went around a track so they couldn't really go all around the park. But um, you know, it gave people a, a chance to try their hand at driving. The tumble bug was a little bit more of a wild ride. It took people around up and down in a, a track. And uh, when citizens complained that it made too much noise, the uh, board of aldermen was contacted and one alderman said that the roaring lions made more noise than the rides. So this ride was allowed to stay. Uh, there was a Ferris wheel uh, that came in in 1928, but it was only there for 10 years because the hurricane of 1938 damaged it pretty much beyond repair. And uh, the Board of Aldermen, which did have oversight of the park, uh, said, no, this isn't safe to operate anymore. And for children, there were old fashioned goat rides and also pony rides. The uh, kid in the cart doesn't look too happy, but let's assume that there were a lot of uh, happy children who rode these, these kinds of rides. Now, as the Great Depression arrived in the 19, late 1920s and uh, through most of the 1930s, there was a decline in attendance at the park. People just didn't have a lot of disposable income. And um, they also were turning more to movie theaters for entertainment. So um, the directors at Norm Bega Park at that time realized we'd better do something to shore up our customer base. So they decided to open the totem pole ballroom. And what they did was they took the theater, remember you saw at the beginning the rustic theater with the wooden benches and no enclosure, well, it became the Great Steel Theater with an enclosure uh, early in the 20th century. And then um, the park directors decided to enclose the, the building entirely um, and turn it into the totem pole ballroom, which you see on the right. And it was called America's Most Beautiful Ballroom. Uh, I should point out that the name totem pole came from two decorative totem poles that were on the stage. You can see them in this photo. They were said to be the work of native people in the Pacific Northwest. 
And uh, of course, now this kind of appropriation of native artwork would not be condoned. And I'm just pointing out that's where the name came from, not because uh, we think it was a great idea now. Um, so right away, live bands began performing at the ballroom and um, dancing was offered Monday through Saturday evenings. And there were blue laws that prevented dancing on Sundays. So that was a day for church services to be broadcast from the ballroom and for um, last things that, that weren't charged admission or didn't involve dancing. Uh, there were really top name acts who came as guests. Um, on the left is Guy Lombardo. And uh, then on the right is an ad for uh, Benny Goodman and um, some other performers. The people would travel from the con all around the country to perform there. And then there was also a house band that would play on a more regular basis. And this was a good money saving idea because the house band didn't have to uh, be paid as much as the traveling acts, but they could still keep people coming in during the week to go dancing and listen to the music. Um, the um, other performers whose names you might recognize are Woody Herman, Red Norvo, Charlie Spivak, and Harry James. And also we discovered that George Ween who was the man who founded the Newport Jazz Festival, the Newport Folk Festival, and uh, a jazz festival in New Orleans, was a Newton resident during his childhood. And it's here by going to Normbega Park that he discovered he loved jazz. And in fact, you had to go with a date to the ballroom and once he couldn't find a date and he went with his mother just because he wanted to hear Benny Goodman. So it's a kind of a, a legendary story, but that, that's where his love of, of jazz began. Um, some of the performances were broadcast on WEEI. And so that generated publicity and uh, more people interested in coming out to the park when they had a chance to come. In 1940, the ballroom was enclosed completely so it could be open year round, although apparently the heating system didn't work too well. Um, so people sometimes performed in their gloves. And um, one of the uh, pavilions that had been part of Norm Bega Park turned into a snack bar called the Teepee Room. And I believe that is an image of the crowd there on New Year's Eve. So um, that also added to the fun of, of going to the ballroom. You could get a drink, no alcohol, as I mentioned, but you could definitely get a soft drink there. Apparently the orange soda was standard fare and a lot of people are specifically remember that. Um, the, um, unfortunately, the uh, ballroom had to reinvent itself and the park had to reinvent itself yet again in World War II, and, and they were pretty clever about it. What they did is they took a dining room of a restaurant at the park and turned it into a mess hall and had a company of soldiers living on the grounds at Norm Bega. And uh, it was the 32nd Ordnance Medium Maintenance Company. And um, it was uh, a place that the soldiers who stayed there loved to stay because they could have pretty good quality food in a restaurant as their mess hall, and then they could go dancing on the weekends. Um, so it was not really a hardship duty. Um, the park did remain open during the war, but attendance was slow. And uh, the park was also used for other functions, including a Red Cross outdoor canteen. And uh, they had drills there for people to serve a lot of food in a hurry in case that became necessary. Um, so after the war, there was interest in the park again. And um, they added a um, kiddie land, uh, which was rides as it sounds for young children. And uh, the bargain price was 10 cents at that time for a child under 12. 
And they also added a ride they called the rocket ship and that was building on the space craze that started in the 1950s. Um, so uh, they also turned the, uh, or they started to use the totem pole ballroom for high school proms. And uh, this is, it was just one high school in Newton at the time, the Newton High School prom. The dancers don't look super happy, but hey, it was the prom. <laughs> Maybe they didn't like the people they went with. They also had Halloween parties uh, for the, uh, the high schools and really liked using the uh, ballroom for community functions. The um, teenagers though, who, who went to the park, uh, for the proms, were slowly starting to develop new tastes in music. And one of the things they began to like in the late 50s, early 60s was folk music. So the manager at Norm Bega Park uh, in that time period decided to go with the flow and bring Peter, Paul, and Mary. It's amazing to me how young they look here, uh, but they were an act in the early 60s. And that was so popular that Route 128 at the time, it's now called Route 95, but it shut down. There was such a traffic jam of people trying to get into the park uh, to see Peter, Paul and Mary. So that was a big success story then, but um, it also was kind of the death knell of the park because it, it suggested that people were really less interested in ballroom dancing and in the formality where you had to go with a date and men had to wear a jacket and tie and women had to wear a skirt or a dress. And people wanted to listen to folk music sitting down or um, just standing and maybe clapping along, swaying. They didn't want to dance. And so there would be acts coming to the ballroom and people would just stand and listen and that was very upsetting to the people who wanted to dance. So there was kind of a, a culture clash. The other thing that was going on at that time period was that um, television was capturing a new generation. And so people could get in their living room the entertainment they used to have to go out to see. And in fact, some of the performers who were seen live at Norm Vega Park started to have their own TV shows Guy Lombardo comes to mind. Lawrence Welk was also an early performer at the park. And um, he was uh, another who had a television show. So people were less willing to go out and hear the music. And then the other thing is, uh, I mentioned that Route 128 had a traffic jam uh, at the Peter, Paul and Mary concert. The fact that it, it was built really diverted traffic away from the park and to more uh, far flown destinations, people could suddenly get to Revere Beach in a high speed way instead of uh, going through the local roads or go down to the South Shore, same thing. So it really did take traffic away from the park. So that is the biggest reason why the park closed in the early 1960s. The park itself closed in 1963 and the ballroom in 1964. There was also tremendous development pressure on such a beautiful piece of land right by the Charles River. And there were lots of proposals for different things. But as we all know now, the one that was selected was the Newton Marriott. And this photo I really like because it shows the Marriott right under construction. And so that went in to a lot of uh, where the park had been. Uh, some people right before we got started mentioned that you could still see vestiges of the park next to the Marriott. There's a lot or kind of a, I, I think lot, is, well, vacant lot is really the best way to describe it. It has some trees in it, but they're pieces of asphalt. And so that's one area where the park was. Um, there's also a very nice park to walk around that the city of Newton did negotiate uh, with the developers to get. And I believe it's called Norm Vega Park, but it's a nature area. And it's a place that's very popular with dog walkers now. So the park did close, but of course, people have wonderful memories of it. And here's a painting 
that we have at Historic Newton that someone did at the totem pole ballroom. And you can see from that, the colors, which you couldn't see in these black and white photos that we have. And uh, they had these beautiful effects with lighting and with sparkly curtains and romantic seating with little lamps by the benches. So people have very fond memories of that. And it's also, I think the whole story of the park is the story of how popular tastes were evolving over about um, the beginning of the 20th century and how the park had to really keep up with that. And then it just couldn't at a certain point. And that's why it closed. Um, but it is interesting to think about what people wanted and how the park was able to please them for 66 years. Uh, so with that, um, I will now stop and see what questions you might have. And also if you have particular memories, those are always fun to hear too. <laughs>